Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, hope you had a great uh, weekend. Uh, hope you were able to join us this weekend. You know, as we just talked about the critical importance of uh, financial generosity as it pertains to what it means for our heart and our heart connection to God. And so if you didn't get a chance to hear that, uh, you can always go online on our YouTube channel, or you can also obviously check us out on our website. With that being said, we're starting a new book today. Uh, we are going to go through uh, the book of Luke. And so time to pop back into the New Testament. We've been in the Old Testament for a while, so it's time to hit the New Testament. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1 uh, as we go through this together. So it starts out with this. Luke writes, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. So before I jump any further, the first four verses of Luke's gospel is actually one sentence in the original Greek. Uh, they're written in a refined, academic, classical style. But then for the rest of the gospel, Luke didn't use the language of scholars, but he used the language of common everyday man the language of the village, and the language of the street. Through this, Luke is saying to us, this account has all the proper academic and scholarly credentials, but it's written for everybody to be able to understand and to actually know. And so I love that it, it involves our brain, but also our heart, and anybody can understand it, and if you want to look at deeper layers. So again, what a great uh, commentary. <clears throat> that was uh, a reminder for me, and hopefully that's new for you when it comes to um, this uh, first four verses you know, of Luke. So imagine this is one, one, one sentence in the original Greek. It says, Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness reports circulated among us from the early disciples. So Luke writes this knowing that other people have already written accounts of the life and the history of Jesus. And specifically, um, most, most theologians understand, is that uh, he's referring to Mark and Matthew uh, that Luke writes after Mark and Matthew actually did. And so there also may be other biographies, but uh, not led by the Holy Spirit, which is why we don't have them in our gospel as well. And so I love that he says, they used uh, reports circulating among us from the early disciples. So he puts himself saying, look, this I was there as part of the early disciples. Now, he was mostly a companion of Paul. You can read about that in Acts chapter 16, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And Paul called himself, you know, a beloved or a well-known, well-loved physician. So you're going to see that here's a doctor who's a man of science, but also a man who understands uh, in his research that he's going to he's going to go into some more details than what um, Mark especially doesn't do. And Matthew is mostly written to a Jewish audience, where Luke is from our understanding, Luke was a Gentile. Uh, that would be Colossians chapter 4. And so because of that, he writes almost from a perspective uh, and emphasis you know, of somebody who's not a Jewish person, which is helpful for us. And so what a privilege that he actually wrote more of the New Testament than almost anybody else. Uh, in fact, if you look at the exact wording, I think he actually writes a little bit more than the Apostle Paul because Luke writes the book of Luke and he writes the book of Acts. And so let's look at verse three, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, there's that doctor part of him. I have also decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything that you were taught. So uh, Luke's gospel, to give you an idea, uh, was written, which, which emphasized more the interests of women, children, social outcasts. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is, the, is also most interested in prayer, seven instances. Luke's Gospel, you know, is the one that emphasizes the Holy Spirit and joy. Luke's Gospel is the one with the most emphasis on preaching the good news, the Gospel. This term is used 10 times in this book, as well as an additional 15 times in the book of Acts. And then we hear this guy, most honorable Theophilus. Who in the world is that? So we don't know exactly, but we gather by his title that he was probably a Roman government official. It's likely, you know, that the book of Luke and Acts make up Paul's, Paul's brief defense before his trial before Caesar. So get this, which is why, since Acts leaves Paul waiting for trial. So that's the very last thing we get in Acts. So is um, Luke and Acts um, uh, written on behalf of Paul that's presented as part of his case before Caesar? Uh, we don't know. 
But uh, there's good speculation that that's, you know, um, who, who it is. What we do know is that he'd already heard about the, this truth that he'd been taught. We don't know if Theophilus, you know, as guys received the truth, but he knows that he's at least heard the truth. And so let's continue. Here's how he begins. When Herod was king of Judea, now this is King Herod the Great, uh, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. So he's a priest, and at this time, the priests uh, had duties in the temple, and there's probably about 20,000 of them, meaning um, they would go on a rotation that would be chosen by lot, which is what we're about to see, in terms of their opportunity to be used or asked to go into high places or special opportunities on special occasions. Let me read about one. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes. So not in man's eyes, and that's what a big difference, right? They were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, which would have been a very a blot on them. And some people, based on their uh, theological understanding, would have thought that, well, obviously you did something wrong, so you must have sinned for this to happen. So it might have been tainted for both of them to understand we're trying to do everything that is right, which is just a reminder to us, just because you don't have the right results at the right time doesn't mean we should stop doing what is right in God's eyes. Just because you don't have the right results in the right time, according to our timeline, doesn't mean we should stop doing what is right in God's eyes. So they had no, uh, they were, and they were both very old. So, so unable, the reason they mentioned that is because unable past the birthing uh, years. One day, Zechariah was serving in the temple for his order was on duty that week, as was the customs of the priests. He was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. Okay, so what would happen is according to the law of Moses, incense was offered, lit on the golden altar. This is outside the Holy of Holies, if you want to look that up, every morning and every evening. By this time, there was an established ritual of practice. It was like a morning time of prayer and an evening time of prayer. And be able to do this was quite an honor for him to be able to do. Uh, and when the people were outside, they saw, this is what they saw, two men exit the temple. So there's three guys that go in, two that do a duty, and then all of a sudden, uh, do a duty, sorry, that made me junior high again. Uh, Zachariah uh, was asked to actually light the incense. So the three of them would walk in, two would walk out, he would uh, light the incense and have a prayer before God right outside the Holy of Holies. So in the special chamber, the special place, and the people would wait and they would be bowing on their knees, waiting for Zechariah to come out. Now, in the presence of God, these guys are walking out and all of a sudden this guy's left alone to talk to God. And it takes a while. So let's notice what happens there. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear, which always happens when we encounter an angel. There's always the fear. Uh, but the angel said, don't be afraid, which is the most common response when an angel en encounters man. Zechariah, God has heard your prayer. Now, what prayer? The prayer that he's been praying about Israel? Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son and you are to name him John. So here's what we know is that he has been praying for a son. Now, he probably, we don't know this for sure, but we probably has not been praying this for quite a long time. He's probably given up on that prayer. But the angel said, uh, your wife, Elizabeth, will give birth to a son and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks, which is the more, more the Nazarite vow that's been given. He will also, this is what's unique, be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah, which will be important later. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. He will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of of the godly. Now, here's what I want to focus on more than anything else today. We got a few more things to cover, but this is really, really important. And that is, have you given up on a prayer? See, a lot of times we think, God, you didn't answer according to my timeline. And so I'm going to stop praying for that. God has heard our prayers, but he's going to answer our prayers according to his timeline. That's what I want to make sure you understand. 
So please do not give up on praying for family members, friends, for difficulties, for challenges, for opportunities, for blessings, that you don't stop praying. And you don't give up because God hears you. He loves you as a father loves his child. And the answer to that prayer could be yes, no, or wait. And a lot of us are in the waiting season for some of our prayers to be answered. So I just want to encourage you to just be reminded that Zachariah and Elizabeth prayed for this for years. And they had not, and they thought it was actually now impossible. And what we think is impossible is possible with God. Keep praying. Then it says this, verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now and my wife is also long in years. Then the angel said, which is a natural thing to understand, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and able to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. So it wasn't a question of, hey, how can this be, which we'll learn actually and talk about tomorrow. It was a question of, I don't believe this can be. And there's a big difference, you know, between the two. And you're standing next to an angel of God who's just told you this will happen. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for about five months. So she kind of pulled herself away so nobody would see, nobody would know. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace, which is what I was telling you, that she would believe based on her not being able to have kids and having no children. And so as we wrap up today, is there something in your heart and mind that you have given up on when it comes to prayer? And may you reinvigorate, me reestablish, reinstitute that prayer once again. God, thank you so much for this day and this season, this Christmas season we're about ready to go into. And I pray you would lead, guide, and direct our steps as we just seek to honor and follow your name. We love you so much and thank you for today. This is the day you've made and we cast our prayers to you, even the ones that we think that you've not heard. Thank you for being a God who listens and a God who answers prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, have a great rest of your day and I will see you again tomorrow morning. Cindy, it's great to see you once again. Talk to you soon.